Well, welcome and good evening, you wonderful dice of all lights. I am Lunar D8, and this is Let's Play Crimson Gray, Dusk and Dawn, Blind Part 3. And we just finished a sex scene I couldn't show on YouTube. We're going to sit here for a moment because, well, the music. This is a new track. We really haven't heard too much. And it's actually, I don't know, it definitely has a very intimate feel. I'm not just saying that because there was a very explicit sex scene that cannot be shown on YouTube. But now that scene is done and you've had a chance to enjoy the music, let's continue the story. There was no one there, of course. The library was every bit as empty as it had been before. She expected John to look relieved, but he actually didn't seem to care. Just smiling at her. Do you want to stick around? I wasn't getting much done anyway. Sure. She spent the rest of the shift alongside him, occasionally reading but often leaning against him and breathing his scent. She could still smell what they had done, and it was a wonderful reminder. Also wonderful was the tension seemed to have eased for him. Sex had been exactly what he needed, making Lizzie doubly glad that she had given in to her desires. When the shift finally ended, John locked up, and then they headed home together. As they walked, Lizzie was surprised to feel his hand slide down from her waist, caressing her curves. Maybe they weren't done after all. Lizzie eagerly pulled him home faster. There's another sex scene already, like, expect like a three minute part. Not that I don't mind it, but... Can't show that on YouTube. Life proceeded normally enough. A significant part of campus was busy preparing for the arrival. But there were even more people who didn't know or didn't care. But it mattered to John, so it mattered to Lizzie. Since their time together clearing out the room had gone well, they kept participating together. It hadn't all been as much fun as that, but Lizzie didn't mind the time preparing, and John seemed positively engaged by all of it. By the way, the sex scene was one of the seven achievements, so I'm at two out of seven achievements, which makes me feel this game's going to be a little shorter because the previous game had ten achievements. Plus, it's kind of referred to as Crimson Grey 1.5, so... But when she came home from class one day, she realized that she might have gotten it entirely wrong. John slumped on the couch, too unfocused to notice her. There was an emptiness in his eyes that she hadn't seen in some time, immediately making her heart hammer in her chest. John, are you okay? Is something wrong? I'm just a little tired. There's not a problem or anything. Of course, there's a problem if you're not feeling okay. I... You don't have to pretend to smile for me, John. It's okay to be sad sometimes. Thank you, Lizzie. It's nothing specific. I'm just having a bad day. And stay right there and don't worry about anything. She skipped closer and gave him a quick hug and kiss, but didn't try to press. Instead, she moved on into the kitchen, getting something simmering. When John was depressed, he didn't want to eat. She had learned that trying to force it could be that turn bad, but the smell would slowly get through to him. While doing her work, Lizzie headed into the bathroom and counted his depression medication. It didn't seem like he had forgotten or that he had taken more than usual, which was good. But though his medication helped, it couldn't make his life perfect. There had been a time when she had desperately hoped that she could do that. She still wished that she could, but she knew that his sadness didn't mean that. He didn't love her. All she could do was be supported. When she came back, he slumped back further, but she saw a bit more relaxation in his posture. Suddenly, her heart ached with love for him so intense that she had to support herself on the doorframe. She didn't desert him. He was always so supportive, so kind, even when it cost him. It was easy to just bask in his presence, to see him as a shining paragon. But her, John, was human, had limited resources. If she had missed the signs, as she sometimes did, one of Lizzie's fingers slid up to her mouth, and she started to bite down on it. But she pulled back. John wouldn't want her to do that. Instead, she moved into the room, determined to give back this time. She checked on the soup, and went to sit beside him, just touching aside a little. 
being present without demanding anything of him. John smiled at her, but didn't say anything. It was a quiet smile that faded into sadness, but she loved it too. These incidents always magnified her love for him. She didn't love him, love his depression, but when he was like this, he seemed to truly real that she couldn't take her eyes off him. Lizzie restrained herself and just sat supportively. After a time, though, she shifted. Later on, maybe they could eat. But until then, do you need to talk about anything? I'll be okay. I think I just overextended myself preparing for Kelsey's visit. Oh, I haven't been pushing you too much, have I? It was so much fun we worked together before, so... No, I didn't mean that at all. There's just so much to do. I know you want to help, but you know your limits, right? You can't help others if you're not okay. You're right. Thanks, Lizzie. Lizzie thought that their conversation had gone well, but she was plagued by doubt. She hadn't noticed this depression income, hadn't been able to prevent it. She began going over every interaction in minute detail, wondering where she had neglected something. Lizzie realized that she needed to get out of her head. If she let herself keep thinking that way, she would end up spending the evening developing elaborate plans to kill someone or kidnap John to safety. She needed to do something, but what? Be quietly supportive or talk about issues. And nothing changes. I will talk to him. Lizzie wanted to be supportive, but she knew that she couldn't help him if she let herself grow unstable. So she hesitantly began to talk, letting him know about her insecurities. Though John didn't have much energy to spare, he was always willing to listen. He replied quietly, taking her problems seriously and helping her get through them. When he was depressed, John could be very irrational, but otherwise he was co so calm and level-headed. She hoped that being in that mode with her would help him feel a little better. When they went to bed, he held her gently, stroking her hair, and she let her tension melt away. As she fell asleep, Lizzie settled on another thought. This visit might be a good thing, but she would be very glad when it was over. When the day finally came, it wasn't as grand as the build-up that led Lizzie to expect. It was just another speaker coming to campus after all, and as one of the better universities in the region, they got plenty of speakers. The growing power of pharmaceuticals was a somewhat hot topic, but it was hardly a source of celebrity. Her expectations had been tempered by John's attitude, though Aaron and some of the other organizers were exhilarated as if from a visit from a guest speaker would change everything. But as usual, he was more reserved. It was one of those things that made his love for her so special, and she loved it as part of it. The low-key nature of the entire thing did a lot to calm her anxiety. Though Lizzie had filled many pages of her notebook with plans in the event of an attack, but given that this was one stop on a long speaking tour, it seemed less likely that Koitek would actually try anything. They were headed out to attend soon, and though it was going to be as casual as most events on campus, Lizzie had dressed up a little out of habit. She lingered by the cabinet, trying to select which weapons to take along with her. The problem was that she had room for so little. Her axe, of course, but the knives were always a problem. J ready to go, Lizzie. Almost, John. Just let me pick a knife and I'll be with you. He leaned against the nearby wall, watching her th thoughtfully as she chose. After a moment, he spoke slowly. I'm just wondering, would you be happy if Kelsey managed to destroy Koitek somehow? Of course, it's a terrible company. It gave you that awful drug and it tried to take us apart. Hmm. But she isn't going to destroy it, just regulate it. Maybe things will get better, but I want revenge. Ah, I meant to destroy in a metaphorical sense, dismantling the corporation. You're more think leveling it to the ground? Blood and flames. Lizzie answered happily and finally picked a slender knife. A good balance of range, heavy enough to be durable, but thin enough to augment her axe with stabbing potential. She set it into its place and turned to him. But I don't mind things like this. Anything that works against them is good. And though I don't want you to hurt yourself, I'm happy that you care about this so much. But if there was some way to leave them intact, but ensure they never bothered us again? I'd take it, of course. You're the most important thing. She leaned forward to give him a kiss, letting this one linger. 
It might be their last until the series event was over. So she wanted to enjoy it. Not that she minded waiting. It made the next kiss when they came together again all that sweeter. I just wanted to say that you're the most important thing to me too. Sorry if I seem preoccupied by all this. No, no, it's fine. I like to see you focus on the things you love. Well, I don't take you for granted. I hope I never do. Ah, John, if you keep talking like that, we won't make it to the event. He chuckled and offered his arm, which she gladly accepted. They headed out to the hall to hear the speech. They... Oh, that's another achievement. Okay. Not sure how long this game is. Like I said, I need to record smaller parts just in case there is another potential sex scene. I don't know. But I'll probably lose track of time and have to like, oh, it's going on an hour and a half. I need to stop. They arrived and found the hall surprisingly full. Almost enough to make her wish they'd arrived sooner. But it would be fine. Aaron waved to them from near the front. But those seats were already full, so they took ones near the back. It's good to see our work wasn't wasted. At least lots of people seem interested. Lots of people from the community, too. Doesn't surprise me. Koytek may not have an, a, any direct presence here, but they manufacture so many drugs, people have to know about them. I am recommended to save. Will do. Lizzie reached out to hold his hand while things were getting started. It looked and he took it and chatted casually with her until it was finally time. After some awkward testing at the mic and a squeal of feedback, Dean managed to quiet people down, though he gave an introduction to Francesca Kelsey. Lizzie wasn't able to focus on it. She already knew the information, and it was essentially just a formality anyway. More importantly, Lizzie looked for the woman herself and found her seated near the front. She looked like her pictures, nothing out of the ordinary. But Lizzie shifted her gaze between her and the exits just to be sure. When Francesca Kelsey took the stage, Lizzie surreptitiously shot a glance at John, but she had been wrong to worry. He had shifted to his purely focused mode, interested only in what she had to say. On my first day of work at the FDCA, my supervisor said I should look for another job because the organization wouldn't be needed for long. She was a good speaker, though her speech had the feeling of one that had been repeated a huge number of times. It had an air of authenticity, but it was practiced authenticity. Lizzie could only focus on it in the background anyway. While listening idly, Lizzie came to a realization, something she had never said to John, probably something she should discuss with she squirmed a little in her seat, wondering what thoughts he might have about it, but she couldn't interrupt. Some people might have said that Koitek created her, with their ill-advised experiment when Abby was pregnant. Lizzie had never felt that way, until now had not reflected on the fact. Now she understood why. The experiment might have made her different from other girls, but Lizzie didn't care about that. What mattered to her was the person she was now shaped by her years growing up, and most importantly, shaped by John. Her world had felt so hollow and empty, and then, when she had found him, she had found monomaniacal in her focus on him. I kind of felt like I mispronounced that. But, also, I feel like there should be an extra L and a Y at the end of that. But he had opened up a new world of possibilities for her. Unable to contain herself, Lizzie leaned over and kissed John on the cheek. He blinked in surprise and then smiled at her, resting her head against his shoulder. Lizzie let her focus drift back on the speech for a moment. The industry's lobbyists would have you believe that their self-regulation has been and will continue to be effective. The primary example is that is always brought up is how thylodomine might Thalodomide? She was kept, was kept out of the United States, and so many children were spared birth defects. 
but as I demonstrate thoroughly in my book, this was more of a quirk of fate than self-regulation, and the thin layer of defense would not be put remotely adequate, given the massive increase in research and development we've seen over the past two decades. Most notably, many of the newest drugs being produced treat conditions that are fundamentally just subjective. Their consequences, if any, will take years to emerge and may not always be clearly defined as birth defects. Make no mistake, there are people alive today bearing the scars of this unchecked research. Sooner or later, they will come forward. Lizzie sat tensely, deciding to hold in her concerns over that development, but John had already considered that. He squeezed her hand and bent closer to whisper to her ear, Are you all right? John, would you want me to step forward and do that? No. His answer came immediately. Lizzie was a little surprised, and John seemed to have taken himself aback. But a moment later, he smiled. No, you matter more to me than all of this. Anyone who stepped forward would be surrounded by a horrible amount of controversy. I want you here with me. Her smile widened, and Lizzie leaned in to kiss him tears in her eyes. She had so many things she wanted to say to him, but some people around them were already glaring at their whispering. When the two of them kissed, most of the glares rolled their eyes and turned away. Their speech ended with Francesca's usual conclusion. The FDCA was a toothless compared to the pharmaceutical giants, and the world needed a far more comprehensive set of regulations. Part of Lizzie's mind acknowledged that is true, but it seemed a very distant and clinical thought compared to the warmth inside her. After the speech, the floor was open to questions, which drew their attention away from each other. This was the part John was most interested in, after all. And Lizzie agreed with him that they were more likely to hear new information during this part. The first person to get to the mic asked a boring, generic question about what students could do in the face of giant companies. She also had a flirtatious walk, so Lizzie scowled at her for both reasons. Soon, though, Aaron was at the mic to ask his question. You covered potent potential impact on the United States as well, but only spoke in vague terms about the need for internal regulations. What impact do you expect the rise of pharmaceutical giants to have on the global south? It was a question Lizzie hadn't really given much thought. She reflected that Aaron was always caring about impoverished and disadvantaged people. That was not a trait Lizzie shared, but looking at it objectively, she decided that it was a good form of kindness. She appreciated kindness in John, so she should give Aaron some credit as well. Outside of her mind, Francesca paused for only a moment before answering. Her response is smooth, but it lacked the practiced air of her speech. Any large corporation is going to have global impact, of course, and we'll see that especially in the rainforest and mineral-rich countries. Needless to say, those ra- relationships will be exploitative. But I think I should be most suspicious of the actions that seem most benevolent, specifically the ostensibly altruistic donations of drugs to various countries for free or produced at a cost. For example, I have long believed that Zaz Inc. is distributing insufficiently tested drugs and effectively using the supposed beneficiaries of their donations as test subjects, but there can be serious concerns even for well-intentioned attempts, such as mental stimulants, manager AG donated in sub-Saharan Africa. They've had positive impact on test scores, yes, but those drugs have serious long-term side effects when not taken according to a rigid schedule. Given the reality of the situation, both financial and personal, many recipients simply won't follow or even have a chance to follow the proper course. We'll be seeing the consequences of that for years. A decent question, if not one that helped clear interest to her, Lizzie listened a few more bad questions before she gensed a general movement in John's body and realized that he was getting up to ask a question of his own, she nodded to him and let go of his hand. She listened in irritation as other people asked questions, 
But finally, it was his turn. He cleared his throat nervously, but wasn't so uncomfortable as he might have been before. For those of us who want to have a career in this field, where do you think we can make the most difference? What balance do you see between regulating from the outside and trying to change the organizations from within? Not a bad question, though Lizzie found herself wondering just how much it mirrored his thought process. He had discussed his thoughts about the future with her, of course, but there was something different about hearing him state the man loud in front of so many people. A good question, but a difficult one. I'd like to believe that the best answer is that the FDCA or another regulatory body, but I'm not sure I'd recommend someone who hasn't started their career go that direction. We'll see what happens with our lobbying over the next few years. As for reforming from within, I'm tempted to say that's impossible. Look at SoftSent. It carried the Japanese economy for a time, but now internal conflict is threatening long-term deflation. In my mind, the biggest threat is that corporations lack meaningful competition and make it effectively impossible for anyone to regulate them. So honestly, what we might need more than anyone is business majors. That got a laugh from the audience, but it struck Lizzie as a serious answer. John pondered it as well, his eyes contemplative as he returned to sit beside her. Lizzie was dying to know his thoughts, but for now she just smiled as he sat down beside her. None of the questions after that particularly notable. Lizzie began to get nervous as their time ran out. Since if something bad were to happen, it would likely happen toward the end. Yet it ended without incident, as had every anxious situation in the years since the battle with Koitek operatives. But she was only slowly beginning to relax. If all those events had gone smoothly, maybe their wedding would as well. And if that was true, then what were they waiting for? Lizzie gazed toward, gazed toward, John, toward John as they headed out, pondering the thought. But there were so many things that they were dealing with, so many considerations, so many thoughts, and it was wonderful just being with him. There was no need to rush. Oh, for some reason that reminds me. Is anyone, um, Lindsay Sterling? She's a very popular musician. She sings and she plays a violin. She released an album, I think about a year, I think it was a year ago, called Artemis. It's got like, it's an anime design. But yeah, the name of the album is called Artemis. The singer is called Lindsay Sterling. It's actually like really, really upbeat, awesome music. So listen to that. Setting the matter aside, Lizzie happily just discussed the speech with John as they headed home. There would be discussion groups, but the only person she wanted in her group was him. They talked late into the night and happily fell asleep still on their clothes. In the middle of a boring psychology class, Lizzie partially listened to the lecture while she worked on her notebook. She was drawing lots of pictures of John now and getting a little better at it. Sometimes her focus drifted though and she found herself writing his name over and over. Now that the event was past, most of her immediate fears had been put to rest, at least temporarily, if Koitek wasn't likely to be tracking them. Then she had more options, maybe. They could get married, after all. If so, she was disappointed that she made them wait so long. But how to get to that point, though? She didn't worry about making John afraid of her. She didn't want to add any stress to his life by seeming too insistent. And yet it had to be perfect. Their wedding would be another treasured memory of their lives together that she wanted to carry around with her forever. A small part of her did worry that he was putting it off for some reason of his own. She didn't doubt, couldn't doubt, that he was fully committed to her. But there was a difference between living together and actually getting married. The professor said something that drew some of her attention away from what really mattered. This sounded like it would be on the exam. 
and he did like to include things that were lecture only to catch students, sleeping students. Lizzie quickly scribbled it down to memorize later, irritated at the distraction. The only reason she was even in the class was that she needed the credit to graduate. At first, Lizzie had actually been interested, wondering if she could learn anything about depression that would help her be a better partner to John. But mostly the class was just useless. Everything was focused on specific patterns of thought and declaring them to be unnatural. When they didn't seem any stranger than the way most people thought, at least not to her, trying to engage with it mentally just irritated her. And what they said about depression just made her angry. They talked about depression like it was a simple problem that would soon be cured. The professor even was a fan of Koitek. Lizzie was certain that if he had his way, they'd take her John away and replace him with a different person. Without realizing it, her writing notebook had become sketchy and angry. Lizzie refocused and tried to draw him again, the way he looked when he came through sadness and showed her quiet happiness deep within his eyes. When the lecture ended, Lizzie wasn't quite there, so she bit her lip and tried to finish quickly. No one usually paid her any mind. She could finish and leave herself in a good place with holy shit. Lizzie reacted instantly at the voice over her shoulder, slamming her notebook closed with one hand and reaching down with her axe with the other. She restrained herself from acting, instead focused on the girl beside her. I feel that I should save. Oh shit, Fox. That's not good. That is some serial killer shit right there. I don't think my personal drawings are any of your business. Uh, it's everybody problem if you're stalking some random guy. Lizzie forced herself to smile, not mess anything up for him. Her body trembled just slightly as she put her notebook away and rose to feet. That isn't some random guy, it's my boyfriend. And does he know you keep a stalker journal? No, that was beside the point. She didn't understand. She didn't understand at all. She was insulting the relationship. Lizzie evaluated her quickly. No physical threat. No capability to put up any resistance. Um, all of these options say kill her. Okay? And it seems to be like, okay, kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her. Where is the one that is not kill her? But so many options to kill her. Don't kill her yet. Kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her. Okay, so... That's, that's... We have like 30 options. They all say kill her, but if I click on this one, it says kill her. It says don't kill her yet. Taking a deep breath, Lizzie maintained control for John's sake. Oh yeah, we're coming back to that somewhere. And answered calmly. I don't think it's your place to meddle with our relationship. Yeah, no, this is just like what we were talking about last week. Either he doesn't know, or you're creepy as hell. And, or he does, and you have some kind of weird, codependent relationship. Technically the second one, but that doesn't matter. If you can't see you need help, you need someone to help you. You shouldn't say things like that. Look, I'm just applying what we learned. John is a kind person. He wouldn't judge me like you do. Then he's just enabling your condition. Lizzie took a deep breath, and it took a moment to think. Oh, so many options, so little time. Okay, these don't change, I don't believe. Okay, my options are slit her throat immediately, remove her fingers and feed them to her, befriend her until an opportunity for extensive torture, end the conversation quickly, end the co conversation quickly and acquire napalm, bury her alive, End the conversation and tell John all about it. Strangle her with her own intestines. Remove her cleanly and dispose the body. Again, we'll try to be... We'll, we'll save this stuff. End the conversation and tell John all about it. Only her promise to him prevented Lizzie from doing what she wanted to do. Instead, she gave the other girl a smile. The professor also said that Alice should only be done for professionals. Are you a certified professional? The response was nothing special, only the best that Lizzie could manage while under such stress. Yet the other girl took a step back, suddenly, uncertainly. Look, I was just making an observation, okay? Perhaps you can make such observations about your own relationship. 
A moment later, the girl fled class with remarkable speed. Lizzie suppressed her urge to give chase. That had not been entirely wise of her, but she didn't care about that right now. Her world was still hollow, and she slowly became aware that she was gripping the handle of her axe so tightly that it hurt. Though her mind still knew exactly what it wanted to do, Lizzie remembered John and set those thoughts aside. Refocused, Lizzie carefully loosened her grip and had it home at the highest speed that wouldn't draw attention. When she arrived, she threw herself into John's arms and held him tightly. He looked concerned and she hesitated for a moment before the words spilled out of her in a white-hot flood. She held nothing back, telling the story in the disjointed tangle of events, her emotions, and what she wanted to do. John just held her and listened, not judging in the slightest. Being in his arms always calmed her, and soon Lizzie was closer to what others would consider normal. She did like being this way, happy and peaceful, and she could do more for John like this. It was an unintended side effect, and it stopped her from slaughtering anyone. John, thank you. I'm always here for you, Lizzie. As she regained clarity, she re- realized that she had added stress to his life by doing this. Though she berated herself for it, Lizzie knew that he didn't mind helping her in this way. It doesn't make you angry to hear the things she said. It does a little, but she probably just has a big head after learning new concepts in class and wants to use them on people. John is kind, too kind. I'll always protect him, and I'm glad you do, Lizzie. But you don't need to hurt anyone to protect me, okay? Okay. She embraced him warmly, trying to pour affection into him instead of just receiving it. Part of her regretted not holding back her thoughts, since it had drained him a little, but at least she knew that he would never judge her. She stayed in his arms for a while after that, setting aside her guilt over causing him stress and just indulging in his kindness for a while. The girl had been right about one thing. A normal boy could never have been with her. John was special and that was why they were so wonderful together. Even as she regained her full calm, however, one thing didn't change in her mind. Maybe it wasn't possible due to the circumstances, but it would have been better to kill the girl. After the incident, Lizzie spent a while sorting through her remaining thoughts. She had completely filled up one notebook, so she started a second and took it with her to boring classes. Math wasn't boring, but she did find herself running her fingers over the edges of the notebook as she worked. Later, for now, she would finish the requirement. Lizzie didn't mind math. It was straightforward, free of judgments. Though she didn't understand her professor's talk about its elegance and beauty, it didn't seem incomprehensible to her. He was all right for a non-John person. After class, she floated, floated along campus to return home. That annoying couple tried to engage in conversation again, but she was able to make polite small talk without committing to anything and keep on her way without wasting too much time. Then she arrived home and found John looking at her notebook. He focused, condensed down to a single point, flickering over everything. His posture, his eyes, the exact set of his mouth, the speed at which he looked up toward her. One such thing... Once, such a thing would have been terrifying. It still made her scared that she might have gone too far this time, added doubt to his mind and ruined their relationship. He didn't have a concerned look on his face, so there would be no simple... He did have a concern. Easy solution. Lizzie, are these the things you felt that you couldn't tell me? What? No, 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 not at all. Okay, I do believe you. Have you been keeping notebooks like these as long as we've been together? She squirmed a little at that, her desire to smooth things over and make him happy, roaring with her desire to be completely honest with him. I had books like these a long time ago, but no, I only started doing it again recently. That's the only one other than the new one I just started. Did something happen to make you more stressed? Is it something I've done? There was a... Real pain in his eyes, and Lizzie hated herself for a brief moment she'd caused him more pain, just as she sworn herself that she would never do again. But her John never rushed to judgment, and he was strong, even if he was often sad, and she longed to protect him. Their relationship had been through more intense things. This wouldn't be the end. Lizzie carefully sat down opposite him, 
It definitely isn't anything you did, John, and it isn't anything specific. I've just been a little anxious lately. I was worried the speech might be more of a problem. I can understand that. He kept leafing through the notebook, leaving Lizzie to squirm uncomfortably. It represented her true thoughts, but some of them felt a little awkward under his gaze, and she couldn't tell what he was thinking. The fact ate her up inside until she couldn't hold it back anymore. You don't hate me, right? Nothing in the book scares you? John looked up at her in astonishment. A moment later, he moved forward to embrace her. And though that was wonderful, it was his honest surprise at her question that meant the most. She had just been paranoid, and there had been no need to fear. Oh, Lizzie, of course I wouldn't hate you. I'm just sad that you were so stressed, and it felt like you couldn't tell me. He wrapped an arm around her and pulled her so they sat side by side then pulled the notebook into his lap. When I read these, I mostly just see you. This is who you are, and I can feel your love for me on every page. Uh, sometimes very literally. He had leaped to the page where she had drawn the two of them naked, embracing one another. It was surrounded by sketches of models in various sexual positions. Lizzie had forgotten she had drawn those and found herself giggling. How flexible do you think I am, Lizzie? I just like thinking about us together. Ever since we had sex in the library, I've been thinking about other new things we might do together. Oh, but I don't mean it isn't wonderful. Just doing it normally. That's great, too. Don't worry, Lizzie. I understand. Turning to a page of one of her drawings of killing Smythe, his lips twisted in a bit of a smile. These are, I don't know, cute? I've seen you murderous, Lizzie, and this is different. Playful. If this helps you release your feelings, I think it's healthy. Oh, John, I should have known you would understand. I'm not perfect, but I'm always here, and I want to understand you. Which is why I have to ask, is it really nothing? Is there a reason you've been more stressed lately? Is it things like the girl in your psych class? Lizzie sighed and leaned against his chest, considering. It was a difficult question, not just because she had to think about what was best answer would be, but also because she wasn't entirely certain herself. In her mind, her thoughts all flowed together, speaking with him. He made him feel clearer, but it wasn't easy. Okay, and none of these seemed to change. Reassure him it wasn't his fault. Ask him to help with dealing with stressors. Explain the thoughts that went into the notebook. Let's reassure him that it's not his fault. John, most things have been wonderful. You're so considerate and you're working so hard for us. Sometimes I almost worry that I'm not good enough for you. That I don't deserve someone perfect like you. Lizzie, no. I could never think something like that. I believe you, John. It's just sometimes... I think I understand a little. We can't always control our emotions. He hugged her closer to himself, and Lizzie gladly leaned against him. Though he was dismayed to hear her sadness... He was also happy to help her work through it, and she was glad as well, though Lizzie still felt many negative thoughts buzzing inside her head. Maybe this would help suppress them. But as warm as things were between them, Lizzie felt a bit of hesitance. When she looked at his face, she saw something shift and realized that there was something less pleasant he wanted to bring up. Had something in the notebook upset him? Her heart began hammering in her chest. There is one thing we need to talk about, though. I don't like, I mean, this page, for example. Let's go and save before we get to the mystery page. Lizzie blinked in surprise as she scanned it quickly. It was a page of dense writing where she talked about him, largely about her love for him and many other things. What could be a miss there? Do you always write pronouns for me with a capital letter? Of course, John. You're not like any other boy. You're the only person for me. I mean, I'm glad you love me, but I don't know about this. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm not I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not sure I'm, I don't understand though. What does that mean? Like what why why would that be a thing of concern? What why not? She stared at him, hiding the true dismay from her face. Inside she was panicking. Usually John was so calm and steady. 
she loved understanding more about him. When she actually felt confused, it always terrified her, forced her to wonder if she was somehow drifting away from him forever. I know how intensely you feel things, but this just feels like a little much. I want you to be my partner, Lizzie. This is, I don't want you to worship me, but John deserves it. You're wonderful and I love you with my whole heart. I know that, but since I love you too, I have to be honest with you, this worries me a little bit. This capitalized version of me. Is that really me? I'm almost all afraid all this is for someone else that represents me, but isn't me in truth. No, no, it isn't like that at all. She clutched him to her, his head against her chest, while she gripped one of his hands in his hair. Gripped one hand in his hair. But through his dismay, she began to understand. The thought upset her a little, and the idea that she might be worshipping some false form of him was terrifying. But she could understand it. John was still her John. If I just refer to you like any other boy, it just doesn't feel right. Like I'm saying they're the same as you. And I would never betray you like that, John. Lizzie, I think I understand that a little, but can you understand me too? I do, John, I do. She stopped gripping him so tightly and let him pull back slightly. They stared in each other's eyes for a while and both smiled. Nothing that had been said changed their love for each other, and they both knew it. Lizzie leaned forward to kiss him gently. John was being too humble, but she wouldn't argue over that with him. She understood why he was upset, and she didn't mean to suggest anything like that. Certainly not to him, and now she needed to avoid suggesting it to herself. Maybe she should accomplish the same thing another way. It was only her fear that she was betraying him that made her think that way. If she had no fear, if she loved him even more, utterly and totally and completely than before, then it wouldn't matter if she capitalized the word or not. Though she wasn't there, Lizzie felt peaceful enough to quiet her thoughts and just enjoy kissing him for a while, and kissing him. When they finished, John pulled back and smiled gently at her. Well, this has been quite a conversation. If you want to take a break, I'd understand. But if you want to keep talking, I'm here for you. There is one thing in the notebook I want to discuss, John. It might take a long time. She saw a little hint of tension in his eyes, but he was always willing to work with her. Fortunately, in this case, that was unnecessary. Lizzie kept her smile off her face until she flipped to the appropriate page. <coughs> okay. I'd love to have a vigorous discussion of this part. John stared at this sketch of the sexual position, then chuckled, and the last of the tension flew it out. Sounds like a stimulating conversation. No, no, we're about to say, like, don't go to our sex scene. I don't want to have to redo this part. <laughs> they spent the rest of the day in bed, exploring one another, even as Lizzie enjoyed the pleasure. She was glad to let go of any nervousness about him. Discovering, she's still capitalizing him there. But she also had a feeling that she wouldn't need them anymore. Don't be a sex aide. I don't want to redo it. Life improved after their conversation. Lizzie overflowed with so much positive energy that she was constantly visiting John for extra kisses and showering affection over him. His reaction was more subtle, but she could feel that it made a difference to him. Though Lizzie wrote in her notebook occasionally, she didn't take it with her anymore and didn't feel too much need for it. In fact, when Aaron invited them to a party with his friends, Lizzie felt so free of stress that she didn't mind them going. To her surprise, the energy overflowed so much that she even enjoyed the party a little. She kept an eye on John all times, noting his position. He was speaking with a mixture of casual, but not so casual that she worried about him. Since he was fine, she didn't mind spending some time with others. Aaron's friends were usually smart and thoughtful, but a little too passionate about irrelevant things for her liking. At the moment, she was talking to a girl named Rose. She was always hanging out with Aaron, and they acted as if they might be dating, though Lizzie also had a strong intuition that wasn't quite the case. It didn't matter to her, so she didn't pursue it. What mattered was that Rose showed no interest in John, and she didn't like how judgmental their psychology class was either. No alcohol at huh, huh? Hmm? Not judging, I was just wondering if it's a personal commitment or something. Lizzie was drinking water from her cup. Though she had thought about it, she knew the exact reason. Becoming intoxicated reduced her ability to enjoy John's presence, 
and slightly decrease your combat potential. Thus, was to avoid all costs. Plus, would remove, like, lessen your inhibition, which are already kind of paper thin. It's just not to my taste. That's cool. Honestly, some drinks taste so shitty. I wonder if people really like it, or if society just convinced them everything, everyone they needed to like it because it's refined or whatever. <clears throat> hmm, I hadn't thought about that before. Society convinces us of all kinds of things, like who decided weddings should be these obscenely elaborate performances, and wearing white is a vestige of an absurd old custom. I was hoping to wear white for our wedding. Normally, Lizzie would have followed the tone of the conversation and not offered any contradiction, since that would lead to annoyances. One reason Rose was acceptable was that she didn't get offended when people disagreed with her, which meant Lizzie didn't have to waste energy on such things. It's 100% fine, if that's what you want. It's just some people think only stumble into it because that's what society expects. But you're about the last person I expect to be that way, Lizzie. Hmm? Really? Yeah, it's pretty obvious you don't care about what other people think. I admire that. Oh, thank you. Lizzie gave her a smile. That wasn't fate. One of the few smiles she'd given to anyone other than him. She's still capitalizing it. And the other days, it would have been... It would never have happened. But being together with John was so wonderful, she felt like she had an excuse, an excess of happiness. Enough to share it with people who were acceptable company when he wasn't there even. Their conversation didn't continue for too long. After that, though, because several of Rose's friends showed up. She didn't try to press Lizzie to join them, so Lizzie was soon alone again. That was fine with her, though she began to ponder if she should collect John and leave. The company didn't seem to have worn them down yet, so perhaps they could stay a little longer? While Lizzie considered that, someone else ambled up beside her. Enjoying yourself, Lizzie? Sure, thanks for inviting us. No problem, I'm glad to hear it. You two are hard to read. Really? Well, you seem to understand each other on a deeper level. And it's nice to see. Honestly, I wish I had a relationship that close. Of course, I don't have one at all right now. Oh, I thought you and Rose. Aaron stopped for a full second, giving her a bizarre expression. He narrowed his eyes as if uncertain if she was being serious. Lizzie, do you really not know I'm gay? And she had been la and he had been laughing and talking with John earlier. And she remembered that he slapped John on the back. Had his hand linger too long? And not only was he single, but he had just said the thing about wanting a relationship like theirs. Oh my god! Lizzie! What the hell is this vision of yours? No, no, I hadn't noticed. Okay. I am close to getting to the end of this part. Do not, like, have him pull down his pants. Because then I gotta redo the recording. Huh, you have that look in your eyes. Damn, Lizzie. You or, or anyone else, I'd be a, almost offended. Is he going to stay looking like that for the rest of time now? Can he go back to the other model? Why does your vision of people change permanently? Oh, I'm just upset I didn't notice. Hope you find a man you love and you should get married. <laughs> I'm okay not trying to ch get a chip much older. It's just, you know, the Midwest is a pretty conservative place. I mean it, though. It took a supreme will of effort for Lizzie to finish the conversation without giving the wrong impression. Such a thing would have been impossible for her as she was three years ago. But thanks to John, she could do a better job of looking outside herself. Though it couldn't touch anything within her, she could intellectually understand what Aaron was saying to her. People disapproving him was very similar to people who might disapprove of her, so her reaction didn't need to be faked. Though she was sharper than most, she didn't think Aaron sensed any of the turmoil inside her. When he finally left, though, she was relieved. How had she missed something so important? Maybe Aaron was a good person, but most weren't. Lizzie had thought she could focus on nothing but her relationship with John. Yet now she realized she had to focus on giving her blind spots. There were other consequences too. Lizzie presumed that John knew and was paying more attention to such things. She had been acting so close to Rachel early in the party. Had some part of him seen it? 
and worried she might be interested in anyone other than him. She didn't fear that John would feel jealous. That wasn't his nature, but he might find some way to doubt his self-worth, maybe wondering if he wasn't enough for her, or something else equally absurd. At his best, he would understand it was false. But if he was depressed, Lizzie realized that instead of taking a drink, she was chewing on the rim of her cup hard enough that she tasted plastic. Better than her finger, since she was in public, but still a sign that she needed to pull back and reconsider. Slipping out as soon as she could, Lizzie headed back home, trying to integrate the new information. She had thought that social understanding she had developed over the years was growing growing up would be more than enough for her to navigate any social interaction. But plainly, she was too narrowly focused on herself and John. Well, you know what? I think I'll go and call this a part right here. So I do need to try to make shorter parts for visual novels, I think. So, hope everyone had a good day. Bye!